Now, if we go back a step to the inputs, um, capital market expectations through three inputs. Uh, we've had a look, quite a good look at expected returns, equities, uh, bonds, fixed income, and uh, uh, real estate. Um, also looking at, at volatility now coming in, and uh, the idea also of correlation matrix or covariance matrix there in terms of correlations too. Remember these inputs here, they're all part of our uh, MVO uh, idea, our process, our methodology. Um, and they'll get input to get our, our efficient frontier out the other side. Because the outputs from all this are the IPS, the overall weights, the IPS weights. So let's spend some time on volatility here. Now, there's a quite important link, I think, here to the equity reading. Just going to kind of make a little note here. Um, because what's coming up is actually demonstrated in, in that one. Now, that changed last year in uh, 2019. Um, and the things they're talking about in here are, are actually applied there. So the, the focus here is more of an overview about how you would use them, whereas in equity, they actually do use them. So that's where I, what I would uh, link you towards the equity area uh, in that last equity reading. It's the only place I can think of where, where they're actually using this a bit more detail. So, so the, the theory we're not going to use here is to, to use really this cumbersome um, covariance variance matrix. Why? Well, guys, the reason is um, the, number of, the number of assets, you know, the number of, of pairwise correlations between them is going to be very, very high. And we have that to show you in a moment. Um, and, and where we're going instead here, rather than using a covariance matrix, can't we use factors instead? Can't we look at the common relationship to a smaller number of factors gives a lot um, less numbers to work with? And uh, the text does walk you through one or two background formulas. There are in the notes, but the, the learning there is, is more of an overview. But like I said, you are tested though on the same things in the equity area. That's where the numbers will, will come in for us to have a go at as well. Your learning outcomes statement here, a bit different, more of an overview, um, discuss. So, if we look at this idea of our, um, of our matrix, and uh, this idea of using variances and covariances for every individual asset, um, it's going to be quite, quite cumbersome. This large portfolio is going to require far too many. And we have got some examples to show you here. Uh, for example, it's recommended that the number of observations should be at least 10 times larger than the number of assets going to be an awful lot of, of, of data there. So the approach that they recommend here is to use factors. Now factors appear in many parts of level three because they appear in asset allocation, thinking about, about uh, our factors. And, and one of the ideas that comes through here about factors is, is similar to a meal. If you think about looking through what you're going to be having for your meal, perhaps uh, uh, this evening. Guys, look through in terms of the what you're eating, in terms of what are the proteins. Um, look through in terms of the fats or the carbohydrates. You get the idea. And in a, in a portfolio setting here, look through the assets. What are the drivers? What are the drivers in terms of growth or income or credit? Of volatility, what are the drivers that are coming in here? And, and if you think about them in those terms, you don't need as many uh, numbers, you don't need as many correlations. Instead, what you need are the factors, what are the drivers? And in real life, if you look at any uh, index, look at any index uh, construction, they give you the factors in real life. They're to hear the, here are the drivers behind that particular index. So the big benefit there, um, with these few common drivers or factors, we can be much more efficient. That's going to help us an, an awful lot. Um, so what are the common links between these factors? Now when you look at, at uh, how this works, if we were to look firstly at the at, uh, covariances here, um, then um, say we had uh, N, uh, N assets there too. We have uh, 50 assets coming in here. 
then the, uh, the covariance version of this, you would need a, a massive 1, 2, 2, 5 individual correlations. Um, look at the formula guys here, k times k plus 1 divided by 2, you would need a, a full 1, 2, 2, 5. I think about it in real life, 50 assets in your portfolio is not that high. You're not normally expect it to be quite a bit higher than that. So the number of, of individual calculations of correlations be very high. But when we work with factors here, if we're only looking at uh, k factors guys here, overall common factors, um, then uh, we only need... Uh, need uh, 50 times the 6, 300 of these correlations. Um, and uh, they talk about the elements as well. Uh, 21 uh, uh, of the elements, far, far less. Now, I mentioned that, that in, in, uh, in this book, in this reading here, we're not asked to do a lot with that. But we are in the equity chapter I mentioned already. So have a good look over. It's in the last reading. Um, you are you do do the very same thing and you do apply it and it's very much more testable there So this matrix approach we are going to be using it Now when you are using any kind of uh, Of this type type of technique then they're back to the old idea of a shrinkage technique coming in here Let me explain what they're what they're talking about here um, that's, that they are talking about the idea of, uh, of taking a number of different forecasts and weighting them. Um, they're saying that, uh, that here that this kind of matrix-based approach has error and is not a good predictor of the true returns, mostly because of the estimated inputs coming in here, that it will be misspecified. Not that it may be, it will be. So, so because it's inconsistent at the start, um, when you increase the number, um, then the model does not converge to the true matrix. Um, so so guys, yeah, this, this idea here, uh, when you're using these, uh, these factors, when you increase the numbers, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get any more accurate. So uh, this uh, matrix, it, uh, yeah, there, there is this problem here with, with using factors in terms of, of our, some model risk, I suppose. There's some model risk. Now, quite a few times in our economic uh, area, we, we've used this term shrinkage here, where you com combine two forecasts. So when you look at the idea here, combining um, a, a forecast in the, in the matrix um, with perhaps a, a, a target matrix here, more like a factor-based one, maybe a combination, maybe more precise. So this idea of a shrinkage is two heads better than one, two forecasts better than one, and uh, we're going to kind of take a, a weighted average of the two forecasts, get a bit more accurate here. Now, you've seen this quite, quite a lot before in the other parts of, of economics. One was in estimating volatility. Uh, here's the, the same idea. Now, we have got some, um, some numbers here. All we're saying here, the shrinkage is we're going to take a weighted average. Um, and the historical... Yeah, the uh, covariance, they're going to weight that by, by 60. The target, they're going to weight there by 40. Um, and uh, lo looking at the two numbers, the sample covariance there, 180. And from the factor model is 220. So rather than rely on any one of those individually, all they're going to do is take a weighted average. Okay, so weighted average, and that ends up being uh, uh, 196. So somewhere in the middle, if you like. Very interesting now we think about our smooth returns. And uh, when we think about smooth returns uh, here, we think about, of course, uh, real estate, and especially when we think about private equity as well. Remember, guys, uh, that, that's heavily from the problem of appraisals. And, uh, and this, this smoothing of data, the volatility far too low, far too low. And one of the ideas uh, here is that the appraisals that we have here are not really accurate evaluations, is to make some adjustments. So where we're heading here is a calculation. I've got an example of this to show you uh, here. So if you don't adjust for smoothing, um, then you're getting really fake data. You're getting fake, fake, especially fake volatility coming in here. And uh, this adjustment to adjust the data for the impact of smoothing is often called unsmoothing. Okay, it's often called uh, unsmoothing. 
Now, this uh, little calculation that I've got to, to show you here is that this, um, this on the left, we're going to call this the true variance. The true variance. And over here on the right, let's have the smoothed. The smooth variance. And uh, the formula becomes uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, friendly here. But all you have uh, are two little values, and these are weights. Um, and in the in the text, they're going in our, our text. They give us a weighting here, for example, of 0.8. So what we need to do is create the the top of the equation and use the bottom of the equation here, and we can apply this here. So looking at the at these numbers from the from the curriculum. So looking at the, the true, let's work out here the true uh, variance. And what we have is 1 plus 0 0.8 over 1 minus 1 minus 0 0.8. Of course, what we're going to get here is we have, of course, 1.8 on top. And then we have uh, 0.2 underneath. And uh, so, guys, what we have here is nine times the, um, the true variance. Guys, the true variance here is nine times higher than the smooth variance. It's nine times higher than the smooth, the smooth variance. What about standard deviation? This is the variance here. Now, the standard deviation, we know, is going to be the, the square root of nine. So standard deviation, square root of nine, is going to be three times so um, it's a calculation. The book has a nice little example of this one. I put it in, in here as well. Some numbers there as well. This idea of unsmoothing, um, using this, uh, this weighted idea, we could use this to, to derive the, the, the true variance being quite a lot higher, this time nine times higher than the, than the, the, the smooth version. A bit of level two coming in now, quite surprisingly. I know you've seen this before, the idea of the, the arch uh, model coming in here. And um, the, the main idea coming in here is that when we are thinking about estimating variance, because we could use this to estimate the variance uh, time t there, the idea that, that you have got these kind of two components coming in. Um, and, uh, and one of them here is the, is the variance uh, t minus 1, the kind of historic uh, variance, and then the idea of a shock as well, the idea of some kind of, uh, of a shock. And they talk about the idea of how much of the historic is remembered. You know, how much of this historic is remembered in terms of a weight, and what weight do you put to the shock? So this idea of having a, a weight, a weight here and a weight there, um, and uh, this idea of, um, of the most recent uh, return. Some of that is remembered and goes into the future, and some of it is also impacted by an idiosyncratic shock coming in as well too. But guys, they're talking a bit about what you've seen before. They aren't doing too much with it um, in, in this overview here.